Advent is a time of patient waiting. It goes all the way back to the beginning, to Adam. You remember after Adam and Eve rebelled, God made a promise that one day the offspring of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, and they waited. Then there was Noah. His father, Lamech, gave him that name, Noah, which means rest. And then it was 600 years before Noah and his family stepped onto the ark. There was Abraham, who received God's promise, Genesis 12, that his elderly wife would give birth to a son, and it was 25 years later before that happened. There was Moses, who encountered God at the burning bush, and God pledged to deliver his people, but it would be a number of plagues and quite a while before that actually happened. And then David, who was anointed by Samuel to be king, and yet David, too, had to wait a lot of running from Saul before he ascended to the throne. And so it is we wait as God's people. And that has quite a lot to do with Advent, as it turns out. Advent in Latin, adventus, means coming. We await the coming. But whose coming do we wait for? Well, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, which we heard earlier, provides an answer. It says, For unto us a child will be born, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. Can you imagine that kind of world? Do you desire to have that sort of existence, one that's marked by justice and righteousness and peace? How different is that from the world in which we live, where scammers prey upon the elderly and then they walk away laughing, where victims wrestle with heartache and bitterness. In our world, naked with lust and greed, people so often grab for whatever they can get their hands on. And just when we start feeling morally superior to the wretches out there, we find traces of that same evil in our own heart. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn observed, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And so that brings us to Psalm 72. It is entitled, Of Solomon, one of two psalms with that designation. The other is Psalm 127. It might also be translated, For Solomon, or Concerning Solomon. I think that's right. I think it was likely written by David at the end of his life, for his son Solomon, who was about to take the throne. We can't be absolutely certain, but I, I think that's probably right. I believe that for two reasons. First, the king is referenced in the third person, he, instead of the first person, I. And then we have this postscript at the conclusion. Again, this concludes the prayers of David, the son of Jesse. And while that pertains to more than just this psalm, it describes all of book two, it does in some way relate to this psalm. Some believe it was a coronation prayer that would have been prayed when the king was taking his throne. That might be. It's a little different from Psalm 2, which is clearly a coronation prayer, but I think it does convey David's wish, his desire for his son Solomon to be a godly man, to be the sort of man who takes seriously the law and who with that righteousness in his heart extends it to others, who governs injustice. Here's what David says in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. It describes when David's time to die had come. He told his son Solomon, quote, I am going the way of all the earth, so be strong. Show yourself to be a man. Do what the Lord God tells you to do. Walk in his ways, keep his laws and his word, by what is written in the law of Moses. Then you will do well in all that you do and in every place you go. So it applies to Solomon, but it also applies to the coming king, 
to the ideal king who is envisioned far out in the future, to David's ultimate son, whose name is Jesus. So how do we read this text then? It's, it's directed at King Solomon and at the same time looking forward to a much different time period. You might say that it offers a 360 degree perspective. For this reason, it, uh, it looks back, or in this way rather, it looks back first to God's promises of old. This language of blessing, surely this comes from Abraham, the one through whom God would bless all the nations. It also looks back to David. You'll recall that God promised David a royal house, right? 2 Samuel 7 and verse 12 says, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, David, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so it looks back. But it also looks forward, as I said, to the coming king. It is, if you will, telescopic. We sometimes use that language in regard to prophetic statements. You've heard this maybe. It envisions a couple of mountain peaks, and there's the near mountain, and, and then in the distance is a second mountain between which you have this large area separating them. And yet when you're looking at the mountain ranges, it appears as if they're right next to one another. And so it is here. There's the near uh, fulfillment in Solomon and then the extended fulfillment. So again, verse 17 of our text, may his name endure forever. This is the eternal king. And then thirdly, it focuses on the current reign of King Solomon himself. What's the implication of all this for us? Well, I think it means that when we read a text like this, we need to have our eyes open wide looking back at God's promises, claiming them as true, confessing them, and believing that they will be fulfilled in the future. So we look back and we look forward and we anticipate the day when all things will be made new. And that perspective, that broad outlook, enables us to live godly lives in the present. God has pledged himself to do certain things. He will indeed fulfill them and that is why I have hope here and now. And so we begin then with that mindset in verse 1. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Now maybe you discern a theme here. Twice we have both words, righteousness and justice. Remember, Israel's kings served as judges. That was part of their job description. You may recall when Nathan the prophet uh, confronted David. He told him about this, um, this sin that David had committed, you recall, with Bathsheba, the killing of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite. But he didn't confront David directly. He told him a story uh, about a man who had taken a lamb and very selfishly um, used it for himself, uh, causing great pain to his neighbor. Well, David was the judge, you see, who was supposed to make a pronouncement on that. Or we think of Solomon, who stood between two mothers, both of whom claimed that this particular child belonged to them. Why did they go to Solomon? Because that's what he did as king. He was the judge, among other things. The king was, therefore, to rule with justice. And this, I think, explains the tradition that we see in Deuteronomy 17. You remember there, it says that the king, when he starts his reign, is supposed to write out the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Write it out by hand and then read that scroll all the days of his life. Why would he do that? Well, in order to be a person of righteousness and in order to rule with justice, he needed to have that truth in his mind and his heart. He needed to be tethered to God's revelation. And here I think we have an insight that is of great importance. Um, you might wonder, what is the difference between righteousness and justice? 
They're very similar, and uh, I've mentioned in the past that you, you can have a translation that, that is of one word that is rendered either way, righteousness or justice, they're that close. There is a distinction, though. Righteousness describes the character of God, His purity, His holiness, His mercy, His steadfast love, His truth, all that is wonderful about God. That's His righteousness. And justice is the application of that character. It is um, relating to other people with mercy and with purity and with kindness, you see. Um, this is where I think we, um, we have opportunity as moms and dads and aunts and uncles and grandparents uh, looking at younger people, those whom we are called to encourage and to mentor. The most important thing we can do is to be people of righteousness, is to give our attention to the Word of God in such a way that it shapes the way we think, the way we speak, the way we relate to others, so that we will be righteous and then extend righteousness. That example, that model, think again of 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. It's that habit of emulating Christ that is the greatest gift we can give to others. Well, verse 3 continues, let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the pure of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. This word prosperity in verse 3 is the word shalom. Uh, it's not just the absence of conflict. It, in fact, describes life as God intends it to be. This is the good life, the long-awaited age in which the world would be set right, where crooked places would be straightened and the rough made smooth. Weeping would become joy. Mountains would drip with fresh wine, and the deserts would flourish. I love the way Cornelius Plantinga Jr. puts it. He says... In the kingdom of shalom, people will work in peacefulness to fruitful effect. Lambs will lie down with lions. All nature will be fruitful, benign, and filled with wonder upon wonder. All humans will be knit together in brotherhood and sisterhood. And all nature and all people will look to God, walk with God, lean toward God, and delight in God. Do you want to live in that sort of world? I know you do. I certainly do. Well, where do we find it? How can we possibly approximate that experience today? Well, there's two key words here that point us in the right direction. Deliverance, deliverance of God's people, and crushing, the crushing of God's enemies. And I don't know about you, but when I hear these words, my mind goes to Genesis 3.15. Again, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That is how God liberates us. That is how God saves us. He wins the ultimate victory against evil, against sin and death itself, and claims us for himself. Well, that's good news. And I wonder today, who needs that? Who needs that reminder as we are facing a busy December and the clouds of fear and dread encircle you for one reason or another. Maybe there's an issue at work. Maybe there's brokenness in your family. Maybe you find yourself struggling either with illness or with some sin. How important is it for us to remember that God crushes the enemy and delivers his people? Notice how the psalmist paints the picture, verse 5. May they fear you while the sun endures, and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his death, uh, sorry, in his days, pardon me, may the righteous flourish and may peace abound till the moon is no more. The saving justice of God has two results. First, God's people will fear him they will reverence him. They will recognize his hand of power at work, and they will have a holy regard for him. And then second, people will flourish. This is the, the peace and the delight of which Plantinga speaks. 
Uh, our experience will go from being one of pain and anguish to one of hope and flourishing. Verse 8, may he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. In a word, it's dominion. God will rule, you see. He will exercise sovereignty over the domain. Now, why was this important in Solomon's day? Well, you have to understand that in this time period, at the end of David's life and the start of Solomon's reign, Israel as a nation was languishing. It was a difficult time. The extended consequences from David's sin with Bathsheba had in, in many ways fractured his reign. Um, Absalom's rebellion had created chaos in the land. And then finally, David's unlawful cent, uh, census, which resulted in 70,000 men perishing. It was a hard time when Solomon was starting. In other words, they needed a righteous ruler who would preside in justice. This is how David viewed Solomon. In many ways, Solomon was David's hope that my son, my son who is called to be that sort of man, will, will help the nation to regain its focus, will bring renewal and uh, lead her in such a way that she experiences God's shalom. Again, 1 Kings 2. Proverbs 29, 2 conveys this in principle form when it says, when the righteous are in authority, people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. Now, how incredibly relevant is this for us as we approach a new election year? as we read the paper, watch the news, have conversations as it relates to the direction of our nation and who will be in office. Um, it's vitally important. I was talking with Pastor Daniel earlier in the week about this. I happened to be reading some letters from the 16th century reformer Peter Martyr Vermeule, and he's, he's, he's done some, he did some helpful reflection on this. How does the gospel come to bear uh, upon uh, civic life. And uh, da Daniel's so kind. He's not here, so I'll talk about him. He just patiently listened to me as I droned on reading this letter. And um, uh, I, this particular one was from Peter Martyr to Queen Elizabeth. This is in 1558. So remember the history real quick. You have Edward VI. He's the Protestant king of England, reigns for six years. There's a lot of renewal. In a sense, uh, the Church of England is born. But then his sister Mary takes the throne. We know her as Bloody Mary. She sent many a Protestant to the stake uh, to be burned. And um, that was dreadful. Peter Martyr escaped the country by the skin of his teeth. And then finally, Mary's sister took the throne, and she's a Protestant. So she's writing to Peter Martyr, who by this time is in Zurich, um, inviting him to come back. He had been the Regis Chair of Divinity at Oxford, saying, come on back. Peter Martyr is getting old. He doesn't want to go back. But, uh, so he graciously declines. But then he writes this letter, okay, exhorting, very carefully exhorting the queen to be a righteous monarch. Here's what he says. Try to imagine a theologian writing this to a president or a king today. Right? He says, you were restored to, the life, to life by the kindness and goodness of God's son, in whom alone you put your trust. And by God's good help, you possess the kingdom of your father and your grandfather. So now think, think of Romans 13. There is no authority except for that which God puts into place. Right? He's, he's making it quite clear. You possess the throne because God puts you there. Now that's a principle that we need to take seriously. Peter Martyr then surveys various kings and rulers, faithful monarchs who illustrate the sort of justice and fidelity that is needed. And then he issues this admonition. He says to the queen, play the role of holy Deborah for our day. Join to yourself some godly barrack. Bring the Israelites who are oppressed in various ways to the sincere and pure liberty of the gospel. 
We have great confidence you will be like Esther who forced the hanging of Haman. Yes, may these holy women give encouragement to your majesty. I think what we learn here is the importance of holding our elected officials to a standard. We all realize whoever uh, enters office will be imperfect and we will have to make compromises in some sense. That is to say, we're not going to find the ideal candidate. And yet, that doesn't mean that we should bring the bar down. We still take seriously what God says about righteousness and justice. And so, this is helpful for us to think about because so often we can get enthusiastic about this candidate or that candidate, whoever it might be, and so overlook that person's faults that we fail to see this standard. At the same time, we recognize that our most virtuous officials pale in reflection, in, in, um, are a pale reflection of what is to come. I mean, even Solomon, he had such a great start. He asked God for a heart of wisdom, but what did he, he, he had 700 wives, 300 concubines. This man had issues, right? You don't, you don't have to be a therapist to recognize that. Um, and the worst part of all is the way in which his heart was carried away into the idolatry of those pagan nations. It's really a tragic story. Um, and that is precisely why. Because all of our earthly rulers fail us. That is why we look forward to the great king, the ideal and ultimate king. It's the passage I read earlier in our service from Revelation 19. I happened to be reading this when I was watching a bit of the Newsom a DeSantis debate from earlier in the week. I can't begin to tell you how cathartic and encouraging it was to read these words as I watched these grown men uh, bickering. So here we are, Revelation 19, 11. Get this. Let this minister to your heart. You ready? Here's the king for whom we wait. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he will strike the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> and so, what will this king do when he comes, when the skies are parted and we finally see him arrive? Verse 12, he delivers the needy when he calls the poor and him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their sight, is their blood in his sight. Excuse me. Notice these words. Um, they all describe deliverance. And here's the thing. When we think about the coming king, we, of course, think about his first advent, born as a child, and his ultimate coming, which is yet to happen. It's a picture of deliverance. Now, during Jesus' day in the first century, there was such a king who promised this deliverance. His name was Caesar. Caesar was called Savior. Caesar would deliver peace, right? The Pax Romana, all eyes were on Caesar, even though people recognized that he was less than righteous. But of course, there's only one true king who's capable of providing this reign. John 18, 37, Jesus said to Pilate, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world. That's who he is. That's what he does. He's come to seek and to save the lost. Born your people to deliver. Born a child and yet a king. Born to reign in us forever. Now your gracious kingdom bring by your own eternal spirit. Rule in all our hearts alone. 
by your all-sufficient merit, raise us to your glorious throne. Well, how do we respond to such a king? Verse 15. Long may he live. May gold of Sheba be given to him. May prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all the day. May there be abundance of grain in the land. On the tops of the mountains, may it wave. Grain doesn't typically grow on mountaintops. I don't pretend to know very much about farming, uh, but uh, I'm quite sure this is true, that it's down below in the valley, right, where you have thicker soil and, and moisture. Not on mountaintops, but here it waves. It's, it's an extravagant picture of abundance. May its fruit be like Lebanon, and may people blossom in the cities. Like the grass of the field, may his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. You may remember when we were in the Sermon on the Mount, I described the fourth beatitude, the hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And I labored over the idea that it's not just righteousness to us, right? What we call our doctrine of justification, how we're declared right. It's not just righteousness in us, our doctrine of sanctification, that is how we're made holy. But it has to be righteousness through us and into the world. It has to affect the people with whom we speak from day to day. We need to show them and, and we want to see them enriched and renewed by this righteousness. That's the vision here. Verse 18, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So how do we respond to a text like this? Again, a text that is speaking to the, the ancient world and is simultaneously looking forward in time. I think we need to see the connection between the cradle, the first coming of Jesus, and his return. Um, we need to recognize that the, the baby lived among us for a reason. And that reason was to be our substitute, to be the Lamb of God who takes away our sin, to, to bear the penalty of our guilt. For this reason, Christ was born, Isaiah tells us, chapter 53 and verse 2. For he grew up before the Lord like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. There was no pomp and, and fanfare and trumpet call. No, he came as a man, and he lived in poverty of spirit. He lived a life of meekness. Yes, there were the angels in the sky singing that night when he was born in Bethlehem, but the only people who noticed him were shepherds. You see, that's how Christ came. But then, Isaiah 53 and verse 5 says, in the fullness of time after this baby became a man, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Isn't it interesting that as verse 4 said, this king will crush the oppressors, but when he came, he allowed himself to be crushed. He willingly went to the place of judgment and put himself in the dock. He put himself in the place where divine wrath was executed upon him. What does this mean for us even this morning as we celebrate the Lord's table? It's possible that you're here this morning and you're recoiling from the light of God's presence. For whatever reason, maybe it just seems too great that God could forgive you. Maybe this promise of a reign and a rule sounds so fanciful that you don't know how to respond to it. And I think this reminder from Isaiah that when Jesus came, he didn't simply identify with the oppressed, but he gave his life even for the oppressor. He gave himself for wicked people such as we. 
He ate with tax collectors and sinners. And he wants to draw all of us, regardless of what we have done, into an intimate relationship with himself. This is the good news of the gospel. This is a gift that no other king has ever imagined giving, giving himself fully and completely that we would be saved. The devil wants us to hide. The devil doesn't want us to step out from the shadows and into the light. And so this morning, as we look at the table, I want us to hear the promise of Jesus. He is the light of the world. Whoever follows him will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is the moment in which we turn from the darkness and we embrace the Savior who is our King. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Let us pray. Oh Lord, it is too hard to believe that you, the great King of heaven and earth, have come to die for us, sinners, so that we would be forgiven, so that we would be children of God. I pray as we approach your table, you would use these visible words to convince us of that truth. In Jesus' name, amen.